So I'm going to like to introduce our speaker, uh, our docent Dudley Oatman. So I'm going to read a bit of his bio here. Dudley is a native of San Diego, and aviation background spans 46 years while serving with the U.S. Army, Atlantic Southeast Airlines, and the Federal Aviation Administration. As an Army aviator for 20 years, Dudley flew 10 different rotary and fixed-wing aircraft. Two Vietnam combat tours flying the Cobra, Huey, and Loach aircraft. He was instrumental in the development of the H-1 uh, Cobra, including numerous weapons and flight subsystems at Yuma Proving Ground. With some 3,500 flight hours and Master Army Aviator designation, Dudley retired in 1986. Uh, for the next 10 years, he flew over 6,000 hours with Atlantic Southeast Airlines as first officer, captain, flight instructor, uh, check airman and manager of pilot training and standardization. He holds an airline transport pilot license for multi-engine land aircraft. Uh, commercial privileges for single-engine land helicopter, instrument helicopter. Finally, for 16 years, Dudley worked for the Federal Aviation Administration as an aviation safety inspector and Boeing 727 and 737 air crew program manager, providing oversight for Continental American and American Eagle Airlines. Additionally, he helped develop the FAA's air transportation oversight system and the Federal Aviation Safety <coughs> Management System, which resulted in FAA publishing title code, a whole bunch of letters and stuff. Is that right? A whole bunch of letters and numbers and stuff. Uh, Dudley has been involved in the museum since 2015 and donated uh, personal Vietnam memorabilia to the museum. Uh, which are in the display uh, Vietnam display case downstairs under the uh, A4. So I'd like to introduce Dudley Oatman. Thank you, Al. That was a little long, but uh, it <laughs> kind of reminds me that the first day I uh, volunteered at the museum, and uh, Vern was my uh, was my docent trainer. And so the first time I, uh, I uh, met him, he looked at me and he said, all right, what have you been doing in your previous lives? So I, I gave him about 10% of that. And he kind of looked at me and he said, so you've just been trying out different jobs until you found one you could do right, right? <laughs> yeah. Hit that nail on the head. Uh, good morning to everybody. Thank you all for coming to our volunteer meetings. And thank you all for the, uh, uh, <clears throat> for the bio. Uh, we're going to be talking about the AH-1 Cobra, and we're going to be talking about our Cobra that's out there in the pavilion uh, in the last part of this uh, this briefing. So we're going to kind of walk through the uh, the development of the Cobras, at least up through the E-model Cobra, which is what our aircraft is. Uh, and I've invited a special guest here today, uh, and his name is uh, Bill Dalby, He's sitting up here. Uh, Bill has some history uh, with that aircraft. Uh, mainly, he was one of the uh, few people that helped the museum get the aircraft from the U.S. Army. Uh, he spent 20 years in the uh, Army. He was a Cobra driver uh, and uh, was a Cobra specialist and did a lot of other things. Uh, of real note is that uh, besides just being a Cobra pilot, he was also a Cobra instructor and a standards pilot standards pilot in the military, at least in the Army, and I'm not sure about the other services, that's the pinnacle of the aviator. You, you just don't go, go any higher than that. You know, I was maintenance officer test pilot, but uh, the standards guys, I had to go take my check rides uh, with them uh, every year like everybody else did. So <clears throat> he's uh, very accomplished. And if you notice his name, Jim Dalby, or I'm sorry, Bill Dalby, uh, he is the son of Jim Dalby, who has flown a number of our uh, World War I aircraft and the Spirit of St. Louis. So he was also chairman of the board for 96, 93 through 96, and also I believe he was at, at uh, different times president and CEO of this museum. So uh, his father has quite a distinguished career as uh, Bill has. And uh, once uh, Bill left the uh, military, the Army flying, where he was also a master aviator uh, also. Uh, he worked for the city of San Diego with the airports division and was the manager of Brown Field down south and was also mostly, most of his time, he was the airport manager of Montgomery County. So he has a very uh, lengthy and extended 
uh, background in aviation also. Uh, he and uh, another fellow that has actually flown our, our aircraft, uh, uh, Skip King, uh, who is in New Zealand this time. Uh, we met last month and kind of went over the presentation and everything to see what we could add or subtract or, or do anything uh, with that uh, at that time. And as Bill and I were communicating, we found out that in 1971, we were both in Vietnam at the same time, uh, at the same airfield, and assigned to the same unit. Wow. So, and we, we figured that we're going to have to go out somewhere and have a, a, an excessive amount of alcoholic uh, <laughs> adult beverages, so then we might be able to recognize each other. <laughs> 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 point when, when, when you're crawling around in the gutter, you don't get a lot of names, but you remember faces. <laughs> so uh, he's he's here. Uh, uh, I've invited him to come, and, uh, and we have coordinated. So if I tell any lies, he's going to swear to it. Okay. So we got that straight. <clears throat> okay. So let's talk about uh, the Bell AH1 Cobra. And you notice that I have that Huey Cobra with a red line to it. Uh, there's a story to that. Uh, tell her I'll be I'll be home in about ten minutes. Uh, but it's also called the snake. Uh, most Cobra drivers uh, will refer to it as the snake, and I've been trying to train myself to call it the Cobra instead of the snake uh, up here. It is the world's first purpose-built uh, attack helicopter, and uh, a lot of people say, well, "How about the Heim 24?" Well, number one, the Heim 24 was two years behind the Cobra. And number two, it was a combination troop transport and gunship. Uh, the Soviets didn't build a dedicated gunship until 1982. So the, the Cobra uh, was, was indeed the first, uh, the world's first. For those of you who are uh, patch uh, collectors or are interested in military patches, <coughs> I've got two of them up here. And these are on the, uh, the helmet bag that's downstairs in the uh, Vietnam display. This one is, is pretty much the standard of the Cobra patches that you see around that, uh, the military and even the Marine Corps uh, look very much like that, that patch right there. Uh, so that's a, sort of a run the mill. This one here is a little bit unique, has a little history to it, because it was, been, it was made by Bell Helicopter, and they were given to the first Army instructor pilots that Bell Helicopter trained to fly the Cobra. They gave them some extras, and so each instructor for the first class that they held they always have uh, two students uh, with each instructor. Uh, they, he gave uh, two uh, of the patches to the first two uh, students that they taught, and, and that's why I got one of uh, got mine from that. <clears throat> so, how many different Cobras are there? Bear in mind that the Cobra has been in service for over 50 years. You know, it's like our Phantom. You know, it's sort of an iconic aircraft uh, in the heli helicopter world where the Phantom is uh, uh, for the fighter jet world. This is not an all-inclusive list either. This is just the major ones, the ones that went into production. So what we're going to talk about is not the, the twin, you probably recognize all of those as the twin motor uh, Cobras. We're going to be talking about the original G model Huey Cobra all the way down to the uh, E model Cobra, which we call the ECAS, the Enhanced Cobra Armament System. So we're not, uh, we're going to stay pretty much in, the, in that center portion there. We're going to talk about the birth of the Cobra. And we can talk a little bit about the Cobra in Vietnam, some of the uh, developments there, uh, improvements of the Cobra. And again, we're going to stop at the E model because we simply don't have enough time to go all the way through them. And then we're going to do a pre-flight of our Cobra. And uh, you, if you hear me say 778, that's, that's the Cobra I'm talking about. That, that's our, our reference uh, uh, to that air machine down there. <clears throat> Early armed helicopters. I don't think there is an aircraft or a helicopter of any type that someone hasn't bolted, tied on, uh, loaded up with some type of a weapon. And the early utility and cargo helicopters were no different. Now there's all kinds of scenarios where they armed those things. Uh, most of them were, uh, some of them were factory modified, most of them were field mod modified. You just, you just can't put an airplane in the field and not expect somebody to bolt something onto it to, uh, to make things go. They're not doing that. Here's the problem with doing that you know, by converting a utility or a cargo aircraft 
is number one, they're the same airspeed as the unarmed. So, uh, for instance, in Vietnam, when you have a landing zone that you're going to take a lot of aircraft into, you want to keep everybody's heads down so you can prep it by firing around the outside of it so that the helicopters can get in without taking a lot of fire. Uh, it's nice if you can fly faster than the aircraft that are carrying the people in there. Uh, second, they make good targets. They're a little bit too wide and they're usually a little bit too slow. Limited ordnance capacity, the only one that's an exception to that is the CH-47 in, in Vietnam that we armed up to the teeth and it's called a Guns A Go Go. And it could carry all kinds of ammunition. And uh, the last one was a, the helicopter gunships were, uh, were very poor against uh, armored vehicles. So the Army's solution was to develop a dedicated attack helicopter. In the early 60s, the Army started working on this thing called air mobility and air assault. And at the conclusion of, of that, they, they put together a board called the House Board in 1962. And they designated what Army helicopters were supposed to be involved. First three are pretty obvious. Ob uh, observation, command and control, transportation of some type, medical evacuation and, and rescue. That's where the helicopters really grew up in Korea with medical evacuation, MASH 4077, etc. <coughs> and the last one here is weapons support of ground forces. All under the control of the ground commander. Hmm. Air Force has got attack aircraft, don't hmm. they? Yeah, they do. They have some great ones. So <coughs> the Navy. <coughs> so why does the Army need a weapons support of ground forces? And it really boils down to two things. Number one, time. And number two, situation. When the Army or Marine Corps needs to carry, uh, call in weapons support of the aerial nature, it takes a while for them to get there unless they are on station. And that's the purpose for the Army uh, aircraft staying on st uh, station with the ground commander. They also know the situation on the ground where the Air Force and the Marines and the, uh, uh, the Navy will do not ha have that information and they have to be briefed. They have to be brought up to speed with what the tactical situation is on the ground. If you have organic air assets, they already know what's going on. So the response time is, is the key to it. So the Army issued in 1965 a contract bid for a uh, what they call an advanced aerial fire support system and seven different manufacturers submitted their bids at the end of this long formal process Lockheed won the bid with their AH-56 Cheyenne that's a picture of it right there Bell lost the bid okay Lockheed said they were having some stability problems with uh, with the uh, Cheyenne they said it's going to take us probably three to five years before we get to production of this uh, attack uh, helicopter. Uh, so they always said, well, what can we do? They weren't real happy with that, but there were, didn't seem to be any options. Any, there was no interim uh, uh, solution. So meanwhile, back at Bell, <coughs> Bell being Bell Helicopter, their uh, initial design bit really left a lot to be desired. This is a picture of it. Uh, it's called the Bell 207, the uh, Sioux Scout, and it had some really good things. Number one, it was narrow, made it a, a smaller target. It had tandem seating for the flight crew. It had a turret that could fly, fire off to the side, and it had wing stores up here where you could add additional weapons. So it was kind of designed specifically as a weapons platform. Uh, and, and that's uh, one of the things I forgot to mention about uh, the Cobra itself. Now, it's not a transport, it's not a cargo ship, it's not a communication ship, so you can't carry anything in it. It only does one thing. <coughs> so, uh, this was Bell's uh, 207 design. Uh, unfortunately, it had a pistol <coughs> engine in it, so it was undersized and it was underpowered. And did not fare well up against the, uh, the Cheyenne. So about this time, enter Bell engineer Mike Falsey. He had a better idea. And Mike Falsey is the gentleman we affectionately referred to as the father of the Cobra. So Mike Falsey, uh, in 1965, Bell Helicopter was very demoralized. They had just lost a major bid contract. Falsey's boss, 
out of frustration and probably a little bit of fatigue, said, uh, I'm out of here, I'm going to go take vacation for a couple of weeks. I want you to start working on some plans for a hovercraft. Well, Mike didn't get the memo, and he had been thinking about this original aircraft versus a modified aircraft in contract negotiations. With an original aircraft, you have to go out on formal bid. So the, the manufacturers will uh, put together aircraft and they'll submit them. The Army or Mili uh, Air Force, Marine Corps, uh, Navy, any of them, uh, then test that aircraft to make sure it meets all the specifications. And uh, it, if it looks like a good idea, they'll test it and fly it around. It's a long, it's an involved process. However, if you have an aircraft that's already in service, and you modify it, you simply show the modified aircraft to the service that you're proposing to give it to sell it to, and they make a decision whether to buy it or not to buy it. <laughs> so, Mike Falsey says, since the Huey A through F models are already in production or in design, why don't we uh, build a skinny G model Huey? Remember that very first slide where I have Huey Cobra it's kind of crossed out. That's where that name came from. This was a marketing ploy that uh, that really, really worked. So, uh, Mike Palsy copied the Huey's tail boom, and then he added some of the 207's ideas. Skinny, tandem cockpit, wing stores, and a turret up front. Falsey's idea evolved. His boss liked it. Soon his ideas received attention from the uh, Bell's uh, Director of Military Marketing and ultimately went all the way to the President and CEO, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, who was uh, E.J. Duke, uh, Dukia. And this is a picture, obviously, of, of Mike uh, with his original drawing for the code. So Duke, the uh, President and CEO, allotted $800,000 and gave it to Mike and his team so that they could build a ship. They, uh, one of the conditions was, it's got to be secret. We didn't want this word to get out until we are ready for it. So they went to uh, Meacham Field there in Fort Worth and rented a hangar. They moved Mike's team in there with the, with the people they needed to build uh, this aircraft, and they started putting the thing together. They used the tail boom from a Huey, added the engine, the transmission, and many systems. What systems? Main rotor head main rotor blades, hydraulics, electrical systems, instruments, seats, uh, fuel systems, fuel bladders. All of that stuff was available. They built it into the first covers. Consequently, they had 80% of the G model, <laughs> quote, G model Huey was already on the shelf. It was in the supply train already had uh, Army stock numbers for it. This is a major selling point for that, uh, for that aircraft. Hmm. Finally, the result was the Bell 209. It was first flown. It was flown five months and 28 days after they started working on it. So they did a really quick program. First test flight, August 28th, 65. Uh, and this is a picture of that uh, original Bell <coughs> 209. Uh, it had a, a couple of features. Number one, the skids retracted. That did not make it into production. It also had a ballistic canopy. And that also did not make it into production. Very expensive, very heavy. Uh, but the turret up here in the front did, and that's, that's the same profile that you'll see on the Cobras all the way up through the, uh, through the Viper. <coughs> they, uh, after the test flights, they flew it to Washington, D.C and showed it to Westmoreland, who was the commander of all Southeast Asian troops, and uh, McNamara, who was the SecDef, Secretary of Defense. Uh, and in, as a matter of fact, just as a side note, uh, Mike Falsey flew in the front seat as they flew that, that uh, 209 Cobra from Fort Worth all the way to Washington, D.C. Anyway, uh, Westmoreland, McNamara, they liked it. Bell said that we can have those uh, aircraft in the field in two years. Aha, there's our interim aircraft. <laughs> So the Army ordered, initially 110 of them, that was fine, that was a little bit later, was uh, increased to 500. Classified AH-1G, AH standing for attack helicopter, and it was dubbed the Cobra, which is a little unusual, 
But uh, they were still saying uh, this is a gene on a Huey, and the Huey already had a name, the Iroquois. And the Army standard was that they named their aircraft after Native American Indian tribes. So they said, well, we have to, uh, we kind of have to do something a little bit different. So the very first unit in Vietnam that flew uh, the Hueys, actually, the yeah, Huey unit in Vietnam, was called the Vietnam Cobras. So they just took that name, added it to it. And that's where they got the name Huey Cobra. And it lasted until about 71, and then they dropped the Huey, and it was just a, just a Cobra from then on out. So this is the, uh, the first Cobras that uh, were in country. August 28, 67. August 28, 65. Two years, one day. First Cobras were arrived in Vietnam. They were assigned to the Playboys of the 334th Assault Helicopter Company. It was equipped with a T-53 L-13 engine with a 1,400 shaft horsepower, cruise speed, dive speed, good range, and about 1,300 of them have been built, uh, the G through the F models. Uh, print engines and verges, about another 1,000. Uh, and some of those are, are conversions, some of them are, are uh, uh, ground up manufacturers. Standard armament in Vietnam, these are the ships that I flew on my first tour in 68, was a single. Uh, 20 millimeter uh, cannon in front, machine gun, I should say. <laughs> On the wings, you had uh, three different possibilities. This is a 19 shot rocket pod, this is a 7 shot rocket pod. Uh, we also had actually four possibilities. It also had a stationary uh, mini gun pod that they could put on the wing stores, and they had a 20 millimeter cannon that they could put on the wing stores. We'll see each one of those here in uh, just a few uh, minutes. Question? Along. Yes. What was the effectiveness did you find of the rockets in Vietnam? Great area weapon. Area weapon. Area weapon. It is not a point weapon. If you if you want to hit something, a, bu a bunker, a building, or an armored vehicle, you just fired a lot of shots at it and hope that one of them hits. Yeah. Now that has improved, but that would be subject for our next next discussion because the the Hydra 70 and the, and the follow-on rockets, uh, they now have laser guidance on. But they were, uh, they were a good area weapon. Okay, so we're going to talk about the gunner and the turret first, and what weapon systems they had. And this was uh, in 71 second tour. Uh, this is the configuration that we usually have. <coughs> the 762 minigun on one side, and a 40 millimeter grenade launcher called Chucker uh, was on the other side. Uh, we could also put two miniguns, we could put two Chuckers in the same turret. Uh, pretty good weapon when it, when it fired, it, it worked really well, uh, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. That turret will rotate in azimuth 215 degrees, anywhere from 12 to 25 degrees up, depending upon the weapon system installed, and 50 degrees down. So you've got a very wide range of firing options. <coughs> The minigun, this is the picture of the one that we have downstairs in the display, six barrels, and they would normally fire 4,000 to 6,000 rounds per minute. That's 100 rounds a second. That's a bunch of them. That's what they fired. 7.62 bullet deer hunting rifles. So How many rounds could you carry? Uh, if we had a single mini, the original, we had 8,000 rounds. When we have the, uh, this configuration, we would carry 4,000 for the minigun and 400 uh, grenade. So it was a very light pull. You yes. were a very light pull. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We actually found out that we would almost always use a three to five second burst. Yeah. Uh, just for reliability of the of the ammo train going to the weapon. Uh, so that's the minigun. Uh, the 40 millimeter uh, chucker, that's what it looks like uh, in the turret with the side of the turret open. Uh, and this is what the, uh, the 40 millimeter grenade looks like. Fires at 400 uh, rounds per minute, pretty good range. And this is what the 40 millimeter looked like. Basically, it's a hand grenade. Just a little less. I think hand grenades with 10 meter burst, and these are like 7 meter burst radius, something like that. <coughs> Very effective 
weapon, except that, notice this velocity, 850 feet per second. A cobra, when it's pulling out of its dive, is traveling about 300 feet per second. So the 40 is only leaving the muzzle with about four to 500 feet per second. That's kind of like what a baseball is. In fact, you could see them in flight. When you fired the 40, you could see the trajectory, which was really good as long as you were within about 10 degrees either side of straight forward. When you start firing off to the side, you would, you would fire based on the impact of your, of your weapon shells. So you would, you would fire, and if they were a little bit high, then you would, then you would bring them down a little bit on your sight, because our sights were not that precise. So the problem with the chunker was, in a cobra, you would see something over here, you would engage it, and, bah, 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 bah. and then you'd watch, and watch, and watch. <laughs> oh, it's a little bit lower. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, you can't re-engage. You have to go back and do another run. So eventually, you got pretty good at it. Uh, you could estimate where the uh, where the shells were going to impact, but it did uh, did have a learning curve associated with it. This is how those guns got uh, all their ammo. Uh, two large ammo boxes directly behind the turret. I see the, uh, more of that a little bit later. This one is for the 7.62. The round one over here was for the 40 millimeter. That's kind of what the sight looks like. Really busy slide, so we'll just go inside the actual cockpit. Mm -hmm. This is the, the turret sight right here. You notice the two hand grips on either side, so you can raise and lower the, uh, the firing of the weapon. You can rotate it all the way around. There's some spring loads in here, uh, or springs. Uh, on the, on the site, so it was, it was kind of neutral position, <coughs> which made it easy to fire. And it was a very effective weapon. Uh, it, it, it worked really well. Now, one thing a lot of people don't realize is that cyclic, collective, and pedals, the front seat can fly the Cobra all day long. Uh, in fact, asked Bill, he was a standards and instructor pilot, he flew an awful lot of front seat uh, time in the Cobras. Uh, oh, also the, uh, the armored seat down here, you can see this panel here, this panel here, another panel over on that side. That's armor uh, protection of the pilot. There's also one underneath the seat and one going up the back. So both crew seats are about the same, a lot of protection for the crew. And also I, I added this little AC thing on there because if you think about it, this window is stationary, that window is stationary. This window, when you close it, is completely enclosed. So you have a sealed cockpit. It's not pressurized, but it is sealed. Which means that when you're flying through the air, you can't get all that nice cooling airflow to keep you cold, and, or keep you cool, because of course Vietnam was rumored to be uh, hot and humid. <laughs> so what they did is they put an environmental control unit in the Cobra, which was very effective, and it fed into the seat bottom and the seat back. So you had something cool to sit on. You also had uh, uh, the air coming out of that eyelid, and there's another one on the other side that we can't see. So you have all this nice cold air coming on top of you and keeping the sweat level down. Yes. Did they ever steam up on you? As a matter of fact, <coughs> yes they did. And, uh, my, my very first tour, uh, I got into country, and there was there's only three officers in the in the company, uh, the XO, the operations officer, and the maintenance officer. Everybody else was down in Saigon learning how to fly the Cobra. I had just come into country. I knew how to fly the Cobra. So the XO and the maintenance officer and me would get in the maintenance Huey, fly down to Da Nang, where we had brand new airplanes waiting for us, but we didn't have anybody to fly them to bring back to the country. So uh, I was elected as the test pilot. So. Uh, I had one of the Bell representatives was actually teach me how to do the test flight on the thing, how to track the blades and all that. Uh, and then we would fly them back to, I would fly the Cobra back following the Huey because I hadn't even finished my in-country transition yet. So I didn't know where I was. <laughs> you know, I said, let's see, we must be in Da Nang because there's ocean over there and there's land this direction. Uh, and the, the very first aircraft that I, uh, that I cranked up out there because they'd seen, I'm, I'm, literally, they were just coming off the ship and being put together. And they, they had one bell rep there, but he didn't want to go out and start flying them uh, until he had somebody to actually train. So we went out there and sat in his first cup of cobra. 
and we were sitting on the ramp, we were just running, and he was talking me through a bunch of stuff, and by that time, we get these plumes of air coming out of these eyeball vents in the back seat and in the front seat. And all of a sudden, I look out, and there's these, these, these ramp people out there all carrying fire extinguishers <laughs> and rolling the great big fire extinguishers up to us because they thought we were on fire. They thought we had a uh, smoke in the cockpit. So, yes. Cool yes. There you go. Yeah. Okay. What? Yes, sir. Why did Bell and the Army think you needed two people to fly this? Uh, in case one of them gets shot. In case one of them gets shot. Yeah. That's the argument for another engine. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, the nickname of the pilot that sits in that front seat is Bullet Catcher. And there's, ah, a, there's a reason bullet for catcher. that. So. Okay. Now let's talk about the pilot and the wing stores. What options are available? This is the Hawk configuration where we've got a dual. Uh, 19 shot rocket pods, inboard and outboard on the wing stores. This is the, the, those are the rockets that will go into those pods. And this is that ammo bay door that opens up. It's a large compartment, and it's kind of compartmentalized because you can load up these ammo cans with the ammunition, and then pick them up with a forklift, take them out of the aircraft, and they just slide right into the uh, to the aircraft. So it makes the uh, rearming a little bit faster. <coughs> Talk about the 2.75 inch folding fin aerial rocket, predominantly used in, in, in Vietnam and is still in use today. Uh, with the, they call it a Hydra 7, a little, little bit different uh, rocket motor. Uh, this gentleman is holding the 10 pound warhead and the 17 pound warhead. The 10 pound is what we fired in the, in the first 268, and then in 71, they've, uh, everything had gone to the 17 pound. <coughs> do, they, do they fire singly or once you start it? You fire you all can of select them. what you want to select. You can select a single pair, double pair, four pairs, and I can't remember the options after that, or you can salvo and fire everything at once. But you don't want to do a salvo because you lose about 40 knots of airspeed by the time they're they're all uh, they're all done out of the tubes. Uh, the 17-pound the warhead, uh, the high explosive, they also have white phosphorus smoke, illumination heat, flush heads, we'll talk about that in a second. But the 17-pound HE was equivalent to a uh, 105-millimeter howitzer, and that's what that is, a 105-millimeter howitzer. So you can imagine one aircraft capable of carrying 76 rockets. That's like a battalion and a half of artillery all fired within a few seconds. So it's very effective. And that's just from one airplane. We always, uh, almost always throw in pairs. Sometimes a, a pair was called a fire team, a heavy fire team is the three aircraft. Flechettes, uh, it's really hard to describe this to someone who hasn't seen them, so I, should, so I got a picture here of what the flechette looks like. And it looks like a nail, except instead of a flathead, it's got the little fins back there. And in fact, what we called them in country was nails. We didn't, nobody ever used the term flechettes. <coughs> Uh, in fact, these are uh, nails that are being loaded uh, at this present time. This is a hot reload uh, in, in Vietnam and then uh, been long. Once I would finish a test flight uh, of the Cobra after it had come out of maintenance, and then I would land at our arming point and I would take our, uh, uh, what, what, what we call condemned ammunition, stuff that had been loaded once, taken out, came back still loaded, they had to take it out of the aircraft for the overnight. So we would condemn it. Well, I would use it after my test flight because I wanted to test fire the weapon systems also. I didn't want to give my line pilots uh, back an aircraft that only could fly and had to shoot too. So uh, my guys were, uh, were loading the, uh, the tubes up there. And you notice that not all of them are seated all the way in the back. It was kind of a safety precaution because it only takes 1.5 volts to fire these rockets. So they would put them all in real close, then they would clear everybody away from the front of the thing, and then they would, one by one, push them back into the detent. Then they would go around to the back side of the pot and actually arm the rocket. I'll show that to you when we get into our pre-flight pre section. Uh, this is another uh, picture of a G-Model Cobra. Uh, on the inboard, you notice they're kind of skinny. They're bigger than the seven-shot pods, but they're not as big as the 19-shot pods. Those are the M18, those are mini gun pods. And that's what they look like on the aircraft, that's what they look like off the aircraft. It's just a long pod right there with a hole in the end. 
The hole in the end is where the uh, minigun would fire. Uh, 1,500 rounds of ammo here, battery pack in the pack. Uh, we set all of ours at the 4,000 rounds per minute because you only have 1,500 rounds. Hmm. It's a very accurate weapon because you're pointing the entire aircraft at your target, and so it's very stable, but you don't have more than 15, 18, 20 seconds of firepower. So it was not, uh, not used a whole lot. Bill, did you use those at all, second tour, or in 71? Yeah, but they were phasing them out because they had a tendency to, uh, to uh, what you call jam. Not jam. Well, jam, and plus they would have, uh, they, you, you, you pull the trigger and they wouldn't stop. Oh, uh, yeah. When they extend fire. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the last, of, this is kind of the favorite of most of the, uh, the Cobra drivers 20 millimeter Vulcan cannon mounted on the wing store on the inboard side. You can see that this is an add-on to the aircraft itself, and this is the ammo pod. There's one on, uh, on both sides of the aircraft. And so you have about a thousand rounds of uh, 20 millimeter, and uh, 20 millimeter yeah. is what that looks like. And you notice that there's a little tip on the end of it. Uh, that's because when these things hit, they just don't hit with a pile of lead and brass. They they go off. They have several, several different types of those rounds. Uh, we'll see those here in just a minute. There are some of the, but they have high ex, uh, explosive, high explosive incendiary, armor piercing, armor piercing incendiary, and then separate rounds. A separate round just means it's basically it's armor piercing also. Uh, <clears throat> but it would fire at sub, between 700 and 1500 uh, uh, rounds per, uh, per minute. And, but it had real good range, 2.6 miles. So wow. in Vietnam, it was especially nice because when we found 50 cal or 23 uh, millimeter positions uh, that the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong had set up, we could have some standoff capability with these 20s that we could we could lob those uh, those rounds in there, and it was easier for us to hit them than it was for them to hit us. So it was a very very popular weapon. Could you alternate the speed of it at all? I'm sorry? The speed that it used up the rounds? Could you alternate? You know, I... To say trigger? I don't think so. Not on the 20s. Uh, on, the, on the miniguns, yes. We had a low rate and a high rate, 4,000, 6,000. I don't recall that we... Do you ever recall that on the 20s? Yeah, they were used no. up. I don't think we did. Kind of a set fire. Okay, this finishes up our Vietnam in 67 through 75. Uh, 831 Cobras have served in Vietnam. They flew over a million combat flight hours, which sounds like a whole lot, but then also think about it. Cobra doesn't, doesn't carry people, it doesn't carry things, it only does one thing, it goes into combat. Uh, eight, 308 aircraft lost 255 pilots. Uh, two seats, a pilot in the back? Yes. And, and, but the, the, the shooter in the front could also fly? Yes. But primarily, the pilot sets you up on onto the site, and then he get, turns it over to the front man. Uh, not necessarily. Yeah. Uh, the, the the pilot in the back, and and uh, mission profiles. I don't know of a mission that we ever did not have two weighted pilots in the aircraft. Okay. So where the, the front guy was just simply the junior guy, and he also operated the turret. Where the guy in the back uh, does the in route flying and also does the maneuvering once they're in the uh, area of operations. So, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's really a joint effort. Uh, the front seat pretty much takes care of the turret. Back seat takes care of the rockets and the wing stored. Now, once we get into the tow missile systems, uh, that, that still pretty much holds true. The back seat's doing the fly and the front seat is, is heads down into the uh, telescopic site. You know, we'll see that here in just a few minutes. Roscoe. Do you happen to know that flyer in that picture right there? Uh, I have no idea. He's, uh, <laughs> you know, he's, uh, That's you, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> Recognize the mustache. <laughs> yeah. It's about a different color. color. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Talk about the tactics, the way they command ship and the attack ships and all that. Um, I, I can't do that and finish this, this, okay. uh, this deal, but that is something that if, if there's enough interest, I'd love to come back and talk tactics, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's just, there's too many, it's just too time consuming, I want to get through the Cobra. So, anything else? No parachutes? 
What's a parachute? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Something to wrap the body in. So, so, <laughs> so you're in for the right. We don't need a parachute. We've got auto rotation. Oh, man. Trust <laughs> us. You know, so, uh, 500 or so uh, other planes just stay there. I'm sorry? Did the other 500 or so that weren't lost, did they just stay in Vietnam? Oh, no, they came back. They came back? Most of them, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we, we did leave some aircraft in Vietnam as, as we uh, evacuated, but I believe they're all, all Hueys. Okay, uh, any other questions before we move on? Okay. Uh, improving the COVID. Now, now we're going to start gyrating away from the Huey COVID that was used in Vietnam to the E model, the ECAS, the Enhanced COBRA Armament System. So, one of the probably the biggest improvements that we had in the, uh, in the G models was we got a bigger engine. We went from the L13 engine to the L703 engine and the improved transmission. So we got 400 additional horsepower. Major improvement. Can't tell you how many times we had to limit fuel or limit uh, armaments in Vietnam um, because of the, of the high density altitude, high humidity conditions over there. So this was a, a major improvement. What's really kind of interesting is that the L13 engine and the C3 engine, basically they're the same engine. They both have two M1 turbines, they have two power turbines. Uh, they could not utilize all of the horsepower that the Dash 13 engine was capable of because of transmission limitations and airframe limitations. So they beefed all those things up, they put a new fuel control on the engine, voila, they have a set, uh, L703 engine. Uh, but that the T-53 engine, uh, I could do an entire briefing on the T-53s. Uh, the guy who designed it, who was a German scientist, that also designed the uh, Juno uh, 004 engine uh, for, the, uh, for the Germans. Uh, also designed the T-55 engine, the first tank engine, the first... The, the guy was a genius. Anyway, I digress. Uh, another major improvement was replacing the minigun with the 20 millimeter Vulcan cannon. You can see it still has the same slew elevation and, uh, and azimuth uh, numbers uh, as the minigun did, but you're firing now a, a gun that uh, has a, a much bigger bullet and the bullet goes boom when it, uh, when it hits. So that was a major improvement to the, uh, to the Cobras. Uh, the ammunition uh, supply training to the 20 millimeter Identical to the 7.62. No big change there. Only three barrels. Only three barrels. Yes. The uh, the original, the one, the 195, the M195, had six barrels, and was capable of 4,000, 6,000 rounds of um, a minute of fire. And that's how the Navy and the Air Force used them. Uh, because they're larger aircraft, and, and they needed the higher rate of fire, uh, because you're firing at something that's moving around in the space in front of you. Uh, the, the Army didn't need that high of firepower, so we, we limited it, uh, this to about 750 rounds per minute. Uh, and we had about, we could carry about 750 rounds inside the ammo bay. So you had about a minute of, of continuous firing up front, which was, uh, which was adequate for the needs we had. <clears throat> okay, uh, another major improvement was the addition of the tow missile system. You can see the tows right here. Uh, this is a, a picture taken at uh, Yuma Proving Ground uh, at Castle Dome uh, Airport, and you can, you can kind of see why we call it Castle Dome. This is what a tow looks like. They're about six inches in diameter, and they're about yay long. They're good size. They carry a 12.2 pound uh, warhead. Very effective. This is a point type weapon. This, you take out tanks, armored personnel carriers, buildings, bridges, because it is tube launched, optically tracked, wire guided. So when this thing fires, two little spools of uh, copper wire in the back that spool out behind it, the missile talks to the site, site talks to the missile, the gunner has the site on a target, and the missile will zoom in and hit the target. Uh, this is the launchers on the, uh, on the Cobra. I think this is an F model, but they're all the same. This is what the tow missile impact looks like. If you're a pilot gunner, you see that. If you're up close, 
you see this. And the accuracy on the toe is just phenomenal. Uh, I, I, I shot a few, well, I've shot about 90 uh, of the toe missiles uh, during developmental tests and about five Hellfires. And they are both extremely accurate. We used to play games with, uh, with, our, with our targeting of the toe, uh, toe missiles. This is how you control a toe. This is the front seat of a, a toy equipped Cobra. And you can see the heads down sight is right here. And that sight is looking through this telescope. And you have two powers. A target acquisition, three power. Target targeting mode is 13 power. So you can actually switch and zoom in on your target so you can keep the crosshairs right exactly where you need it. This thing is motion stabilized, vibration stabilized. Uh, when you're looking down through the TSU telescopic sight unit and the aircraft starts moving, you just see this very gentle move in the sight. If the target is moving, we used to target uh, cars and campers that were traveling Highway 95. Uh, there uh, at the <laughs> east side of the Sure. ground. <coughs> And, and once, you, once you put the crosshairs on it, even though it's moving, and you take your hand off, you control it with this little joystick right over here. You can't see it behind there, but that's what it looks like. It's just a little joystick like your kids play their video games with. And it's just absolutely wonderful. Because like I say, it's all stabilized. And once you put the, uh, the pipper on the target, and the target's moving, you can take your hand off, and it'll follow that target until the aircraft moves or the or the target changes direction or speed or velocity or whatever. So it's a, it's a heck of a lot of fun to shoot. Uh, also, in the uh, uh, this is from the s model Cobra. It does have the flight controls, just like the other ones do. Uh, and they have improved armor. They had a, a piece that you can just barely see the corner of it here. And there's another big piece of armor over on that side. One question I always get when we walk around our Cobra in the, in the uh, pavilion, is that there's a little bulge on the right hand front side. And you can see that little bit of a dimple right in there. The only reason that dimple's there is so that if the uh, co pilot or the gunner does a hard right bank turn, the cyclic doesn't hit the side. So it's just a clearance bubble. But I get questions about that all the time when we're downstairs. So you'll see that again. Uh, other improvements canopy removal system. Uh, is right there. You pull that and it blows all four side windows. They have deck cord lining all about them. I'll, I'll show you a better picture of that a little bit later. Much improved rocket sight system. And they have helmet sights so that the pilot with the uh, special visor on his helmet, uh, he has sensors on the helmet also. And so as he turns his head, that movement is picked up by these two sensors and two that are back here behind him. And he can fire the 20 millimeter turret and just, just by looking. You fly along and look over here and he can engage a target while he's flying. So, uh, in 1999, the Army retired the Cobra, replaced it with the Apache, that's the Apache there. And the Super Cobra and the Viper are still currently in use as of today. Uh, with the Marine Corps and several other, three other, at least three other countries out there. So, it's, uh, it's still going a long way. So, this is our Cobra. And we've got about uh, 15, maybe 20 minutes to get through this, so I think we're doing okay on time. <coughs> These are the documented facts uh, that I know. I, I have stuff in the file that I say I. The museum has things in the file that verifies it was constructed in 77 as an S model, delivered to the Army in 78. The last unit of assignment was 7th Infantry Division of the Fort Orton. 1992 was gifted to the museum. 1999, after Restoration by both Convair and uh, Air and Space Museum volunteers uh, was mounted in the pavilion. Undocumented uh, events, is, uh, we even have this in our commercial guide that it was uh, involved in uh, Operation Urgent and Fury in Granada, uh, but uh, we can't find any documentation on that. Uh, also, 85 to 88. Uh, assigned to NASA Ames Research Center at Moffett Field. Uh, 87, upgraded to an E model. And action in 89, Operation Just Cause down in Panama. 
So we can't document this stuff. I'm going to continue to work on that uh, and see if I can document all that information. So this was 778 on its final approach into the uh, pavilion mm -hmm. at the Air and Space Museum. I would just love to have seen that crane. That has been a big sucker. We put the, both the Cobra and the trimotor in there that way. And this is in, a, sorry about the quality of these pictures, but it's the only pictures the museum has. Uh, there's a kid, I'm sorry? Sorry. You know, I, I remember when it was open like that. Oh, yeah. This was the last, last of that. Yeah. So you can see the Cobra's right there. Uh, its mounting post is already in, and as well as the post for the, uh, for the trimotor out there. Uh, we have two storyboards on there. Basically, they cover most of the stuff we've already talked about. Uh, it talks about the, the uh, empty and gross weights, the speeds, uh, the engine, the armament. Uh, so our Cobra has a coin wall in cannon, the a pair of the 19-shot rocket pods, and a pair of the tow uh, launchers for total weight missiles. Last performed pre-flight by a gentleman by the name of Luke Aran and uh, Kerry Dowling, uh, who belonged to the uh, Charlie 29 Cav up at uh, Fort Ord. Uh, and they uh, flew, they, they were the last crew to fly our Cobra. Uh, during their, their flight, they had a uh, problem with the, uh, with the engine control. Uh, they were afraid that they were going to, they might lose the engine, so they elected to do a running landing, and on short final, they got a fire warning light in the engine. So they uh, scrambled the trucks, they, they did a successful running landing, and the aircraft never flew after that. So it was gifted to the museum rather than repaired from that uh, minor fire that it had. So, <clears throat> pilot seat, co-pilot gutter seat. And that gets into the little bit of discussion we were, we were just talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, I, I, would, I would sometimes take the, uh, the crew chief of the aircraft on a test flight. Uh, other than that, pretty much we always had two rated pilots in board. In fact, once you became senior, then like if, if Bill and I were, were at, the, at the same unit and we got assigned the same aircraft for a mission, half the time we'd flip a coin to see who's going to fly in the back seat, who's going to fly front seat. And then after lunch, we switch. You know, it's as simple as that. But we always kept two rated pilots. So even though it's called a gunner seat, uh, it is a co-pilot seat. See that bulge right there? You remember when we saw the picture of the, mm -hmm. the that's the, the other side of that picture. Uh, fueling port here, grounding point. Uh, this panel right here opens up uh, for the hydraulic bay access. You can open that up as part of your pre-flight check for leaks, check for fluid levels. There's also one over on the other side. The Cobra has two independent hydraulic systems. The Huey uh, uh, helicopters, if you lose hydraulics, you can still fly the airplane. It's very, you get a lot of feedback in the controls, but you can still fly the airplane and you can land it. The Cobra, you cannot. If you lose both uh, uh, hydraulic systems, uh, you're gonna very quickly become a streamlined brick. <laughs> so that's why they have two independent hydraulic systems. Uh, this little thing right here is called an aerodynamic crew access device. <laughs> it's a step. <laughs> <laughs> That's, there's one down here. You, you put your right foot on the ammo bag because they're always open. Put your left foot here, right foot here, left foot swinging up and it'll crawl into the cockpit. So that's how you get on board. Uh, in the, underneath the uh, on the pilot's door, down by the handle, we have the CW3 Dolby. CW3 Dolby, who is here with us today. 20 years in the uh, Army, Cobra Specialist, Combat Tour in Vietnam, talked about most of this stuff, arranged to get the uh, Cobra uh, gifted to us. Uh, these are his bona fides, and uh, airport manager, I think we talked about all of those things right here. So thank you so much for coming, Bill. I appreciate you, your participation. Continuing on the right-hand side, we'll talk about that in a few seconds. But this, uh, everybody always wants to know, what's that say up there? Well, these are the static ports. It says do not plug or deform holes. So that's the <laughs> static ports for the uh, altimeter, uh, vertical speed indicator, and some of the computers on board the, uh, the aircraft. This is the ammunition door uh, uh, access. 
when it's open, it looks like that, and that's where they, they slide the ammo horse, uh, uh, ammo drums in, in and out. <coughs> There's two document times when uh, the Dover has carried passengers, and they were both in Vietnam. One time was a, uh, as a ejected, I think, Air Force pilot uh, that ejected over South Vietnam, and the Cobra was the first aircraft to get to him, so he told him to open up the ammo bay door, doors and hang them on. And they evacuated them out. The second one was a uh, crew chief wow. that jumped out of the back of a CH-47 mm -hmm. that was in, in flames. Uh, this is up in the Arsenal Valley. And uh, he said he, he, he would rather fall to death than to, to burn. So he jumped out of, off the, uh, the back door and happened to land into a recently made uh, arc light uh, B-52 strike with uh, a lot of soft dirt. Mm -hmm. Landed in the soft dirt, the Cobra came down, same thing, opened up the ammo bay doors, he climbed on, got around. Cartridge action actuated devices, and it says, warning, this aircraft contains a cartridge actuated emergency escape system equipped with explosive charges. I'm really glad they put that on there, because do you think a fireman is gonna read that when he comes up <laughs> uh, to, to a Cobra? And it's laying over on its side, and all of a sudden, both windows blow out. Uh, I guess they had to do what they had to do. So this emergency escape system, dead cord, all the way around, both windows. And like I mentioned earlier, you pull one pilot or co-pilot, it's going to blow all four windows. So you have to get out of the aircraft. The old style system was this breakout knife. Mm. <laughs> they weighed about three, no, no I'm serious. <laughs> And the things weighed, what, three, three and a half pounds. Yeah. It had it was solid steel, and it had a little pointy end on that side. And, but it was so heavy so that you could have some inertia. And you would just break it. It was like breaking out of an egg, is what it was. Uh, we were already talked about the, uh, the rockets and the toes. And I think I mentioned uh, the difference between a rocket and a missile. A rocket is ballistic. Point aircraft, pull trigger, fire, forget it, because there's nothing you can do about it. A missile, on the other hand, is most likely going to be guided, so you have to follow it all the way to impact. Uh, this is the back of the rocket pods. I told you about how cautious they were in loading these things on the uh, on the aircraft. Then we push it back, but these uh, these little contacts back here had uh, spring loaded in two positions, here and standing up. So they would go back, they would open all of those up, slide the rockets in, clear everybody away, push them back into the detents, then they would walk around to the back side and trip all of these down so they would make contact. Because again, a volt and a half, static electricity can fire these rockets. So it was never really a serious problem. I know, how many do you remember? We had many in my from, career. From Vietnam, I remember one. And then we were both at Finn Long and Vietnam, so. But yeah, so there's, everybody was a little bit nervous about these things. They had to be careful. Uh, moving back to the, the tail section, this is the all moving tail plane. I call it a horizontal stabilizer, but it does articulate. Notice that there's sunlight on the back side there. We'll, we'll look at that in just a second. This little fin antenna down here is for the UHF radio, all uh, Army. I think all military aircraft have uh, FM radios, VHF radios, and UHF radios. Mm -hmm. FM so you can talk to the guys on the ground, VHF so you can talk to civilian towers, and UHF so you can talk military to military. <coughs> all the aircraft, of course, had infrared suppressant paint, and this is uh, the front half of the VOR antenna. Everybody thinks it's a handle, but it's not. Uh, come at. Uh, yes. Of the Air Force aircraft, uh, all aircraft have, and Navy have UHF, but the A-1 uh, Sky Raider is the only one with UHF, VHF, and FM. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, all, all Army aircraft had all three, three of those, those uh, in there. Okay, and this is what the uh, horizontal stabilizer does. Uh, this is part of a, a main assist line because we would check full forward cycle, full aft cycle to make sure that the tail end line it up with one of these appropriate three rivets. And what this does really is it helps keep the aircraft stabilized. So as, as you push the nose over, it turns that thing back and kind of keeps the tail down instead of nosing over quite so fast. So the, the rotor system 
will tilt and give you an immediate response, but the, the aircraft itself will do it very slowly. So it's stability for the aircraft uh, because it is a weapons platform. And it also expands the center of gravity limits of the aircraft. So it gives an assist on, the, on both those areas. This is the back half of the VOR antenna. Uh, this is a, a 42 degree gearbox. It's up on top of the tail boom. That's a sight uh, gauge for the oil level. And I'll talk a little bit more about that whole tail rotor thing uh, in about three slides. There's a radar warning antenna. There's four of them. There's two of them back here on the, both sides of the tail boom. There's two of them up front. So that if you're being painted by uh, a targeting radar, it will give you an oral uh, alert and on your display on the uh, dashboard, you'll see where the threat uh, is, is located in reference to you. Uh, tail boom vents, uh, a lot of avionics is, is uh, mounted in the tail boom. Tail boom's been strength against uh, 23 millimeter uh, projectiles also. <coughs> All the way back to the tail rotor. Uh, this is it back here. Tail rotor is an anti-torque device. You've got a fuselage that you want to keep pointing in this direction. You've got a, a uh, rotating wing on top of you that's going around this. If you don't have something at a hover to counteract that rotation here, then pretty soon the fuselage is going to be going the same speed in the opposite direction. So that's basically what a tail rotor does. It's sort of like a rudder, but not entirely. It has the additional purpose that when you're at a hover, then that's what you use to correct your heading. Uh, also, there's a uh, shroud right here that covers the 90 degree gearbox. And again, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, the tail rotor pylon, a lot of people don't realize, you notice know, that this is uh, convex right here. When you see the next picture, it will show concave. So it is an aerodynamic vertical stabilizer. Oh, wow. And it, cool. it helps with the uh, uh, with the directional stability and control in forward flight, it takes a little bit of the load off the tail rotor. And if you have the tail rotor shot off, it fails for whatever reason, you still have a little bit of aerodynamic pull while, as you do a running landing. So it makes, it makes the aircraft a little bit safer. Uh, simple navigation light, the strobe light back here. Uh, tail skid that sticks out. All it does is protect the, uh, the boom. Two, uh, Two maneuvers that you do in an auto rotation. The last thing you do at about 70 to 90 feet or so is you pick up the nose and you try and zero out your forward airspeed, uh, which gives you a very extreme tow low uh, situation. So the tail spit protects about that. And also, if you do an app of the earth flight and you're flying around really low and you do a, what's called a quick stop maneuver, you basically stand the airplane on its tail, pull in a lot of pitch and stop really fast. So that just gives you some added protection. Uh, I don't know of anybody that's actually hit a tail, tail stinger, do you? Nah. Only during auto rotation or yeah. something like that, but that's it. What was the primary cause for uh, losing the helicopter? I mean, without being obvious, I mean, what was it primarily ground fire? What, what brought down, how did, what was the... Hmm. I mean, I would say it would have to be, I mean, if you take out the accidents, but the accidents were one of what would you say 20 percent maybe yeah. or so and the rest were ground fire ground fire yeah and the ground fire was just basically taking ground to so knock out the engine yeah or the, the crew yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah or there you get a lucky shot and hit the crew like what happened to me so yeah well yeah mostly combat related. but 20 percent mechanical and 80 percent ground fire yeah uh, no, i would say that's the bill you yeah, you know, you got other factors like weather, no look kind of concern. Never any pilot error, though, right? And no pilot error. No, no pilot, pilot error. error. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and instrument landing equipped. No. IFR? Yep. No. Well, we were trained for IMC conditions. Uh, they had a few, in early Vietnam, no. There was, we, they used to give us tactical instrument tickets. They were right. just enough, if you got in trouble, you can fly up in, on top and then get to somewhere safe where you can, you know, come on down. But we practiced IMC conditions, but we didn't actually do it because we weren't certified for IFR conditions. Okay. Yeah. This is the whole tail rotor system itself. <clears throat> and 
this, these are covers. The, the left side of the uh, tail boom is the same as the right side. Uh, so I thought this was a good chance to show some pictures of the tail rotor drive shaft cover. There's one there, there's one there, and this cover is over the 42 degree gearbox. And why do you have all this stuff stuck on your tail boom anyway? Here's the engine, main rotor transmission, main rotor blades. At the bottom of the transmission is another output shaft. That one faces the rear, and there's a series of drive shafts that go all the way across the top of the tail boom to an intermediate gearbox, 42 degree, and that's because that's the number of degrees that it turns. And the drive shaft that goes up and that turns the 90 degree gearbox or the tail rotor gearbox, that's what spins the tail rotor. So that's how it gets its power. Oh, the tail rotor, by the way, pedals. All controlled by your pedals. <laughs> rotor pedals control the tail rotor. Rudder pedals, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you push them real fast and they make it spin faster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, fresh air inlet, look, it looks like it may be an engine inlet, but it's uh, really not. It's engine in inlets up here. This is for cooling for the starter generator that's bolted onto the accessory uh, drive of the uh, engine itself. Gives a little bit of extra cooling. <coughs> Infrared suppression, uh, exhaust nozzle, nozzle as it uh, points up so it deflects the the exhaust of the engine up into the air, up into the rotor wash of the main rotor blade to help cool it off and reduce the uh, infrared signature. Uh, its common name is the toilet bowl. I'm sure you can't imagine why. Here's the front half of that tail rotor drive shaft cover. Uh, navigation strobe lights on the side. And this is the uh, tow missile launcher. This is the rotor head. I'm not going to get real involved with this. Uh, about three years ago, Roscoe uh, did a pres presentation on helicopter aerodynamics, and it was really, really good. I can't really add uh, much to that. So I'm just going to describe a couple of points. Everybody has heard about the Jesus nut. They want to know where the Jesus nut is. So here's the main motor drive shaft. This is a diagram of it. It has splines. Those splines match splines in the rotor head. The rotor head is this big thing right here. It sits down on top of it. They move it back and forth until it slides down on the spines. They hold everything in place with the Jesus nut. It's a big nut. It's about uh, five and a half, six inches in diameter. Very hard. Your uh, cars, the lug bolts on your cars, you torque them down to 60 foot pounds. Jesus nut, 650 foot pounds of torque. It takes a special uh, gear reduction ratcheting torque wrench to get that thing on tight. But yeah. it's important, so we. Yes, it is important. On top of the genus, where you see is where the net hole is, uh -huh. the bubble, you can lift the entire helicopter by that point. Oh, yeah. 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 That, 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 that's what I was talking about right here. You can lift the entire aircraft that way. Well, obviously, because in flight, that Jesus nut is carrying the entire weight and plus the G force weight of that aircraft during, throughout its entire flight profile. So it's a, uh, it's a really important, it, it has uh, spines on it also because there uh, is a lock um, piece of metal that fits into those spines and it has a, a high grade, like, it's like a grade six or seven bolt that goes down and through it to lock it into place so that that thing will not turn. So, yeah, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of focus on that. What are the G limits? Uh, I do not know. I don't know. Not really. We don't have any way to measure it, so why Why should we know? Did you ever loop it? I'm sorry? Could you ever loop the airplane? Did I the personally? No. no. But we've seen helicopters that actually there are some, the Richard yeah. Brothers, so they do it quite well. Well. The, these, these have been rolled and they have been looped. Yeah. But you have to be very careful. You have to keep positive G's right. on them the, the whole time. Yeah. They will not do a negative G maneuver you run into mass pumping. Right. So, and officially, I don't know of anybody who has rolled or looped no. a Cobra. No, it's not. Yeah, really. Intentionally. Intentionally. <laughs> but it's been done. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's like the wrong way to Oregon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, As you got in the high G, you see that flat plate where it slides down there, you see it? It's a flat plate. It flexes during high G's. It actually decreases the pitch in the blades.
to avoid that, to avoid no. the yeah, hydro sure. yeah. yeah. So it's, that, it's actually designed you know, for it. That was an innovative design that came in after the Huey rotary type rotor head. Mm -hmm. And that's what made the, that rotor head right there made the Cobra be able to be more flexible to fly the way it did because yep. of that design. Yep, sure did. Yeah, it started off as the 540, and then went to the 7, yeah. 47. Okay, uh, just something to remind you, as the rotor blades are turning, they are constantly, every ro uh, revolution, changing pitch. They're always changing pitch. The pitch control rods are attached to the swash plate down here. Your cyclic controls the swash plate. It transmits uh, because you have this little thing called gyroscopic precession. The swash plate is what takes care of that for the flight crew. But these rotor, these uh, main rotor blades here are always changing pitch as they rotate around. Uh, Pito tube is uh, up here in the best spot to have <laughs> Direction finding loop antenna down here. There's also a GPS antenna and, and a couple of other antennas that are that are down there, uh, but I, I couldn't get a picture of them. The uh, main rotor blade came in composite, tolerates uh, 23. It's a composite blade, so it's made out of uh, fiberglass and epoxy and resins. Uh, very tolerant uh, and will go all the way up to the 23 millimeter shell impact. Uh, the taper on the uh, on the end of the way, most of the helicopters, when you look at them, they don't have that taper. The reason is, I mean, it's a wing, so it reacts just like any other fixed wing aircraft. It has wing tip vortices and all of that stuff, which are detrimental. It's got an induced drag uh, to the aircraft. And the helicopter blade has the same thing. But they found out, and I'm, I'm not an expert on this, that doing this increases the cost of the blade by a substantial amount. It only improves the aerodynamic efficiency of the blade by about 3%. So it's sometimes just not worth it to build those more expensive blades. Why yeah. does not the um, blade borsh interfere with the uh, pe the pressure on the pedal tube? On the, on the pedal study? Yeah, that uh, seemed like a bad place to put it to me. but. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the expert on why it's there. We, we used to, the, the original code was after the pedal tube was on the very end of the nose uh, with the, the early landing lights. Uh, someone determined that, that that position up there uh, is a good position for the pedal tube. Bill, do you know any more about that? Well, where the TSU is now, that's where the pedal tube used to be. Right. And they put it up there, I think, for no other reason. <laughs> that was the only alternative location to put it. Uh, they had air, also air data systems to help the accuracy of the rockets later on. You see it like a little weather vane on the, you see it, I saw it on a couple other films, mm -hmm. uh, slides you had. But, but it's found up in that same area. It's in that same area, there's negligible yeah. effect on it. And, and you're on the very inside of the rotor system anyway, so you're not going to have that much interference on, on the PM2. But there is going to be some interference, and I don't know why. Uh, here's our engine air intake we talked about. This is just the, uh, the deck cord again around the, uh, uh, the pilot station. <coughs> Talking about the launcher, this is just a full side view of it. These little wheels back here, by the way, are, are, are not to make it look cool, although it does, uh, but they are actually, when the uh, tow missile ignites, uh, it has some debris from that ignition process, and that just funnels all of it and keeps it from slapping into the tail button on the back side of that. By the, uh, of the aircraft. Uh, the front seat of our Cobra has the name uh, Botrolic? Botrolic. 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 Okay. I've got it in my mind one way and it'll be difficult to change, but I will try. Uh, Captain Botrolic was uh, assigned to uh, AFSCOM Aviation Systems Command for the uh, Army back in the 90s when uh, Bill's dad decided that uh, we needed a aircraft for the museum. So since his son, Bill, uh, flew the Cobra, he said, gee, let's go try to find a Cobra. Bill called his friend, Bill Trollick, uh, because they served in Germany together. And he was working for uh, the project manager for logistics of the Cobra program, program manager's office. He said, you know, I think I can find you one. He found 778, and the rest is history. And that's how we that's how we got it. Cobra seven. Both the names have some 
uh, specific history with our <laughs> Uh, this is the, uh, the 197 Vulcan cannon with the three barrels, 750 rounds of ammo, and basically fires 750 rounds a minute, or somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, landing light, one of the two landing lights down here, wire strike indicator, we have better pictures coming up. But on the, uh, the 20 millimeter uh, recoil adapter is here, and that's to keep some of that impact from going into the airframe of the aircraft. Uh, elevation drive motor, so that would raise the gun up and down. Azimuth drive motor here, that would turn left and right. Barrel drive motor is right here, and that actually spins the, uh, the three barrels around uh, and, and loads the ammo at, at the same time and ejects the, the cartridge. Telescopic sight unit, uh, this is in the very, very nose of the aircraft. You can see the barrels of the 20 right down here, so it's right directly above it. Radar warning. Uh, right there. Now, and this is the telescopic sight unit. You know, we saw this a little bit earlier uh, that the uh, gunner is looking through uh, when he uh, engages uh, the weapon. <clears throat> this covered side over here is probably empty uh, because it normally contains airborne laser tracker and range finding. Those are kind of expensive things. I'm sure they probably pulled that stuff out uh, before they gifted it to us. In fact, I'm really surprised that we, we actually got the, uh, the TSU with it. Uh, two little tabs uh, up here, uh, that's a visual uh, position indicator because when you're in the co-pilot seat or the pilot seat, you can't see where the gun is. When the gun's all the way out to the side because it's such a long barrel, you can see it. But if it's in, in any intermittent position, you can't see the thing, so they put that little wire right there so you can see wherever the TSU is pointing is where the gun is going to be pointing. So it gives you an indication. Before you fire your rockets, you have to have your 20 stoked or in the in the center position because if it's all the way out to the side, it will get hit by one of the rockets from the inboard uh, wing pods. And this one right here is a wire strike deflector, and you can see how it works better from this view. So if the wire hits this, it will slide down, slide down this, and go right into the mid wire cutter. So this is the wire cutting system. Uh, radar warning antenna here. I have a better picture of that right here. This is what the wire cutters look like. This is hardened steel. It's kind of sharp. And on this leading edge are little teeth. And it looks like a hacksaw blade. So it'll, it'll start as the, the wire slides into the actual cutters and it'll, it'll give it some stress points. So it's like for telephone wires or something like that? Yes, telephone wires. Uh, I know that it will uh, defeat a 5 16 inch uh, stainless steel cable. From personal? <laughs> I'm sorry? I <laughs> see. Yeah, well, from observation of, oh. uh, of the test we did at Yuma for it. Uh, I think, uh, my memory just, I, I don't know if it would go to 3 8 or not. But yeah, it will take stainless steel cable and things like communication wires and, and things of that nature, you know, slice right through them. It's pretty, pretty effective. And we, we were using these in, in the covers in the early 70s. With well, the idea, so if you see some wires hanging in the North Vietnamese jungle somewhere, you can go it's, down. It's not for the wires that you see, it's for the wires that you didn't see. Oh, it's the passive you fly fire. around. I mean, you, you don't say, oh, here's some wires, let's go cut them up, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, it's, it's for the wires. What Charlie would the problem would do is they would actually take our communication wire and find it. And they would string it across the valley, hoping to get some helicopters, and they did. So that's why they came up with the wire strike system. Cool. In Vietnam, he was at the altitude, you know, diving fire, and go back to altitude. After Vietnam, it was train flight. And so when you're flying a train flight, treetop level, or like you could fly into wires and not even see them. Mm -hmm. well, what, what, <coughs> what weapon was the against the helicopters? Was it RPGs? Or? Anything. Yep. Anything. Mm -hmm. Earlier train flight, low to the ground at trains, you could have a grunt hidden in the, in the grass right below you. You could fire, move up right into the firing position. Now you know he was there and engage, uh, simulate engaging a target, look down and see him waving at you. And he could have knocked you out with a pistol. Mm -hmm. could, like anything, depending on how you are, you know, in the, in the uh, how high you are, what, where you're moving, hovering. So but in tactical flight, when you're hovering fires, I mean, you're stationary and anybody can knock you out. Mm -hmm. 
Was, that was, was this the same helicopter they used on the TV show? What yeah, TV show? Airwolf. Oh, no. Airwolf was a different one. Airwolf. Different airplane. I never watched it. Yeah, just elaborating on, on what Bill was talking about. There, there were several times that we would prep the landing zones uh, because we would prep the tree lines around the outside of them, and the uh, the UEs would come in to drop off their troops, and then all of the Viet Cong who had been laying in the rice paddies would be able to sit up and just start shooting and just cause mayhem. And when, when we hadn't touched them because we were we were focusing on the uh, on the perimeter out there. So yeah, there. There was a written article a long time ago. <coughs> South Africa, a helicopter got shot down by a ball and arrow. Mm. It hit the oil oh, yeah. line. Mm -hmm. So anything will do it. Yeah. Yeah. Golden view. Yeah. Just like any other aircraft, if you get a critical place, something bad's going to happen. Well, you can throw the rock into a chair or you can knock it Okay. Uh, down at the bottom is the lower wire cutter. It's much larger than the mid wire cutter, and there's also identical one up on top of the aircraft. So we have a total of three wire cutters uh, installed in the aircraft. This is one of the two landing lights. Uh, this one is motorized. Uh, it has, uh, swings down and can be, uh, be adjusted uh, by the pilot. And then if you're uh, flying with goggles on, a uh, night vision goggles, then you would use the IO landing light, which is a infrared source so you can see if you turn on the regular landing light you white out your goggles yeah, yeah, that's not really a landing light that's like you say it's an IR light it actually had a very dark lens in the front <coughs> uh, mm -hmm. and the, you, you couldn't see it nice and clear like that it was just to, to, to the naked eye said why are they covering the landing light well it was an IR when you're under zero illumination with nitrogen goggles, the early version of it, you couldn't see. It was just like video noise, like turning to a TV station with no signal. You just get that white Spark. speckled. Mm -hmm. That's all on a very dark night. So you would have to turn the lighting light on or uh, infrared light on to give you contrast, to give you some sort of light. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you got up out of the, uh, the area, you would turn it back off again because other people with optics would be able to see you. Mm -hmm. So that's all that was, was for uh, in goggle operations. Yep. Okay, refund is complete. What we've talked about is the birth of the Cobra, a little Vietnam stuff, improvements, and a pre flight of our uh, aircraft that's downstairs. Do we have any questions? Do we have an already asked? Ron? Okay, Bell made it. Bell made the airplane, right? Yes. Where does Huey come from? Was there, was there a Hughes? Involved somewhere? Or where, where does Huey come? Yeah, I know it had nothing to do with okay. Cobra. Huey, uh, the main Huey, comes from the original Iroquois uh, twin pilot side right, by side sure. Bell helicopter. Mm -hmm. uh, a model, B model, C model, right. and, and all of that. The original uh, method of, of, of assigning those characters for the Army, they called it a, a uh, helicopter. Utility oh. dash yeah. one. Mm. Had nothing to do with Hughes then. Okay. Had nothing to do with Hughes. <laughs> okay. Not a thing. But it became so popular as a name for the aircraft. Iroquois was almost never used, but they actually molded H U E Y onto the tail rotor pedals. <laughs> Not rotor yeah. pedals. Notice I call them the tail. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's where it came from. They later changed the name or the designation. Uh, of the aircraft to from helicopter utility to utility helicopter UH-1 mm -hmm. and the AH attack helicopter CH cargo helicopter. What uh, happened to the Lockheed Giant? Uh, the, the program was canceled in 72. Mm -hmm. they, uh, so there was no talk about a merger of uh, designs? I mean, they must have just been uh, not that I'm aware of. I'm shocked to see this occur. Not that I'm aware of, but I did not frequent all of the bars in the yeah, yeah. uh, <laughs> But I mean, if you're, if you're the Lockheed salesman, you're just upside <laughs> down now, you know. Yeah. Uh, I got in, into Yuma when they still had the last two of the Cheyenne just before they left. They were only there for like a, I got to sit in one. Oh boy. Uh, I talked to the engineers that were working on it and they said, the problem with the Cheyenne was it was 20 years ahead of its time. Yeah. They didn't have the technology, they didn't have the metallurgy, they didn't have the science necessary to get everything to work. Mm. But when they were just about to come 
get everything together. Uh, they were doing uh, the, uh, the stability test, and that's where you test to see if your aircraft is negative stability, positive stability, or neutral stability. So you're flying along, and you input a sudden control change, and then you let go, and it should return to your normal smooth flight, positive stability. If it gets worse, then that's negative stability. And neutral stability is it just keeps doing it. And they had several, it just keeps doing it moments with the Cheyenne. Uh, one time it was so bad that it, uh, main rotor blade hit the uh, tail boom and uh, it crashed and killed both uh, both bodies. So they had uh, a shutdown for a long term while they investigated that. Uh, and they finally solved that problem, but it took them a long while to do it. And by that time, the Huey or the Cobra was so popular and was working so well in Vietnam, they said, sorry, that's it. They yeah. canceled the program in 72. So, yeah, very good. Any other questions? Very good. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks.